Well, it's time to start. So welcome everyone to our session today titled Food Safety in the COVID-19 Era and Beyond. I'm Hank Cardello. I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute where I direct its Food Policy Center. This is a very timely subject when we talk about food safety, especially given uh, the tragedies surrounding COVID-19. We've also seen the connections with the food supply system and comorbidities related to the coronavirus pandemic and hunger. All those things do connect. They're not isolated any longer. So today we have an outstanding group of experts with us today to share their knowledge about food safety, food security, and their deep reservoirs of knowledge in this space. Before we get started, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the session is being recorded, so you don't have to take as copious of notes as you normally might. And then second, after we're done with our panelist discussion, uh, we welcome your questions. And there's a uh, button down at the bottom of your screens that, that says Q&A. So kindly uh, submit those questions and we'll try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. Also, if you can, please indicate who the question is for so we can direct it properly. So now what I'd like to do, it's my pleasure to introduce Vimlendra Sharam, who will give us an introduction to today's proceedings and tell us a little bit about the interlinkage between the food safety and security with COVID and hunger and world health. Vimlendra, Vimlendra is the director and liaison office for North America of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. He has more than two decades of leadership experience focusing on rural development, agriculture, and food security issues. Previously, he served as vice president of the World Food Program Executive Board and chairman of the International Fund for Agricultural Development Evaluation Committee. Welcome, Vimlendra. We look forward to your comments. Thank you, Hank. And a very warm welcome to all the participants who have joined us today for this webinar on food safety in COVID-19 era and beyond. In 1736, Benjamin Franklin addressing the Philadelphians had said, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Though said in the context of the fire that had ravaged Philadelphia then, nothing could be truer about food safety than this. We can choose to ignore food safety only at our own peril, for ignoring it will have a disastrous impact on human health, economic prosperity, food security, and sustainable development. Noting that in a world where the food supply chain has become extremely complex and where any adverse food safety incident has global negative effects on food security, public health, trade, and economy, the United Nations General Assembly at its 73rd session in 2018 designated 7th June as the World Food Day. Cognizant of the urgent need to raise awareness at all levels and to promote and facilitate actions for global food safety on the basis of scientific principles, they called upon Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, and the World Health Organization to lead efforts in promoting worldwide food safety. As hunger hotspots multiply and hunger numbers rise due to COVID-19 pandemic, food safety issues have come into sharper focus. We all know that there can be no food security without food safety. And unsafe food compromises nutrition, which is an essential, essential component of food security. If we intend feeding adequate and nutritious food to the 821 million hungry people, a number which is likely to rise substantially due to the pandemic, and if we intend achieving the SDG 2 in foreseeable future, strengthening food safety measures will be of paramount importance. Impact of climate change and today's global food supply chains make food safety landscape more complex and challenging than ever before. New food safety threats are ever emerging. Aflatoxin is a particularly good example, which has wreaked havoc on health and economic well-being, especially of the world poor. Sadly for us, food safety management has not kept pace with the emerging challenges. 
Instead of horizon scanning and foresight, we are still in the reactive mode. Only foresight and knowledge alongside surveillance techniques can help countries keep food safe. It's obvious that unsafe food cannot sustain human health and has tragic social and economic consequences. You all know that unsafe food kills nearly 420,000 people every year. And as DGWHO said, these deaths are entirely preventable. On the economic front, unsafe food is hindering development in many low and middle income economies, which lose around US dollar 95 billion in productivity associated with productivity losses associated with illness, disability, and premature death suffered by workers. These are burdens which the world can ill afford. Improving levels of food safety globally requires collaboration amongst the stakeholders and development of new technologies, sustainable commitments, and strengthening of human and institutional capacities. We must remember that food safety is everybody's business. Whether you're a farmer, farm supplier, food processor, transporter, marketer, or consumer, food safety is your business. On our part at FAO and WHO, we have focused forces to assist countries in preventing, managing, and responding to the risks all along the food supply chain. By working with food vendors, producers, regulatory authorities, and civil society, regardless of whether food is domestically produced or imported, we are committed to play a part and we encourage all of you and your organizations to play yours. Speakers in the webinar today will examine efforts to maintain safe supply chains through the pandemic and beyond and explore actions needed to minimize future logistic disruptions and build a more resilient system and processes. I'm confident that the deliberations will be insightful and will leave us with enough food for thought as we join forces to make the food we eat safe and nutritious. Before I hand you back to our moderator, Hank, let me give a shout out to my friend JB from Mars Incorporated, who initially came up with this idea of having a webinar to mark the second World Food Safety Day. And on behalf of FAO, I would also like to thank our keynote speaker and other distinguished panelists for agreeing to share their thoughts with us today. Over to you, Hank. Thank you, Vimlendra. I appreciate you putting things uh, and framing the circumstances around food safety and food security. And also most important, recognizing that we're still in reactive mode and we're here to try to uh, provide insights that ultimately lead to solutions. Uh, to put more context into this opening and our discussion topics, Dr. Stephen Jaffe will now give us a presentation on food safety before and beyond COVID-19. Dr. Jaffe is lecturer at the University of Maryland's Agriculture and Resource Economics Department. He is an expert on food security, food safety, agricultural risk management, and agricultural policy. He also recently produced the Safe Food Imperative, Accelerating Progress in Low and Middle Income Countries. Welcome, Steve, and thank you for contributing to the session. Good morning. Um, and uh, good afternoon and good evening to those uh, uh, in a different time zone. I'm gonna share a screen now. And um, um, and I'll walk through the uh, presentation. So uh, the subtitle of this uh, presentation is, is Flattening the Curve on Foodborne Illness and Costs in Developing Countries. So for many policymakers in developing countries, uh, food safety is really the image on the left. It's food safety is a highly technical issue pursued by specialists. But uh, as most of you uh, on the, um, this webinar know that food safety is really the result of the actions and inactions of many stakeholders uh, operating in, in very diverse environments and that public policy can influence those food environments as well as the, uh, the awareness and capacity and behavior of um, uh, the food system players. And food safety is certainly more than, than test results or even managing um, uh, foodborne illness outbreaks. Uh, food safety is critical to achieving uh, sustainable development goals. It's foundational to uh, realizing goals related to poverty, hunger, 
um, and good health and well-being, and, and it's integral to uh, quite a few of the other SDGs. Until quite recently, when food safety has been on the development agenda, this has been predominantly in relation to trade and market access concerns. And these are much more visible. Uh, we see these where uh, trade is restricted or consignments are rejected. And the sort of political economy around this is that on the trade side, we tend to have much better uh, organized uh, lead companies and as well as farmers, the costs and impacts are borne by them and they have the, they have the ear of policymakers. Um, and the, the roles in terms of uh, public oversight are actually quite clear. On the domestic side, we, we don't tend to have uh, consumer organizations in developing countries. The uh, responsibilities on the government side tend to be uh, split between multiple ministries and agencies. And the burden of foodborne illness falls largely on people that don't have a voice, uh, whether this is the poor uh, or children. So we have this sort of iceberg phenomenon of uh, the visible impacts, the trade impacts, and that tends to be uh, the target then of, of many interventions, especially uh, development assistance interventions. And below the surface are the larger yet often invisible or unmeasured um, domestic impacts. So uh, we're getting more visibility now, uh, both from sort of recent analytical work and, and on the ground work that FAO, WHO and others are doing. On the analytical side, the big breakthrough was the uh, 2015 publication of the uh, Foodborne Disease um, uh, Reference Group uh, supported by the WHO. And that's where we're getting these global estimates on uh, foodborne illness, of 600 million foodborne related deaths, uh, with the vast majority of these uh, occurring in uh, emerging Asia and Africa. And uh, also where children bearing a, a disproportionate uh, burden. Um, on the right side, uh, two years ago, we came out, the World Bank uh, in affiliation with other institutions. Uh, we looked at it more from a social science point of view and an economic point of view. And we estimated the annual uh, costs to developing countries in terms of productivity loss and or treatment costs of $110 billion, um, that these costs are very closely linked to sort of a stage or level of, of development, um, and that we, we put the uh, domestic food safe, domestic costs of unsafe food at, at 20 times that of trade-related costs. And if you, in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, something like 50 times the costs. Um, in, in the safe food imperative, we, we outline what we call a food safety life cycle, where we're trying to relate the, um, the economic uh, impact of unsafe food to um, uh, levels of income and um, uh, the pattern in sort of agri-food system transformation. And we ask the question, can, is this sort of an inevitable trajectory or can countries through um, through foresight and planning and preventive measures flatten the curve on foodborne illness and its economic uh, impacts. So basically for low income countries, which we call sort of traditional food systems, um, staple foods, uh, uh, starchy staples are, are the dominant uh, uh, position in the diet. Uh, food value chains are generally short, a lot of self provisioning of food. A lot of the food safety issues derive from unclean water or animals. Um, and generally, um, the, the sort of key food issues still for low-income countries are availability and affordability. Um, capacity of food safety is low, but also the effective demand for safe food is low. The situation changes uh, quite dramatically for lower middle-income countries, which are the transitioning ones. And here we have rapid uh, urbanization, we have rapid dietary change toward animal products, fruit and vegetables, processed foods, uh, more out of home eating. Um, and so the exposure of the population to a wider set of hazards uh, is potentially there, yet capacity is lagging and trying to catch up. We still have predominantly informal food distribution systems or fragmented food systems. Um, that together with the lack of hard evidence really has uh, uh, resulted in limited budgetary resources going for regulatory oversight. And at the same time, the sort of formal sector private governance 
is still limited to a small part of the market. Consumers are worried at this stage, but have no tools um, to, to act on that worry. Things change as we get into the, uh, the modernizing, this yellow part. This is upper middle, uh, upper middle income countries where capacity is catching up uh, to, to need. And this is because we have a, a rapid formalization of the, the food system, uh, improved uh, scientific basis, public administration. Um, consumers are now uh, beginning to um, have a purchasing power that influence, moves the market and also they're influencing government regulation. So we, we laid out basically a scenario where things would actually get considerably worse for today's low and lower middle income countries if we were operating in a business as usual scenario, but that this is not inevitable. So what is business as usual? Um, for many countries, pre-COVID was really a lack of a comprehensive national policies, priorities, and programs in food safety. Um, that the, the capacity was sort of um, uh, fragmented as well as um, uh, uncoordinated, uh, both between, uh, between ministries and between central government and decentralized government. Investments would tend to happen with projects and not necessarily be linked to one another. Um, much activity um, has been sort of more in reactive mode after the outbreaks, after the uh, food, uh, after the uh, export uh, restrictions. So a lot of firefighting happening rather than uh, preventative measures. And on the regulatory side, um, sort of a method of approach which is sort of seeking out where uh, there's violations, non-compliance, and punishing the violators uh, rather than uh, enabling uh, compliance. So we have a sort of legacy of, of the deficit of, of data, of direction, of accountability, and, and of trust. And the, all of these are now accentuated uh, in, in the context of COVID. So in terms of uh, underinvestment, here's just one illustration. So um, some of the uh, FERG affiliated researchers have looked more deeply at animal source foods. And it, it looks like um, these are a major uh, part of the uh, foodborne disease um, burden, uh, greater than 40% in some two thirds of developing countries. And then when we look at the OIE uh, veterinary service assessments, um, about a dozen of their indicators relate very closely to food safety. And what we show here is that um, the distinction between the upper middle income countries, which is in the orange, and the lower middle and the low income, basically for these areas, a very small proportion of low income or lower middle income countries have been deemed to have adequate capacity in these dimensions of the veterinary services, which are highly related to food safety management. And, and um, here we're showing that actually capacity matters and matters a lot. And that low investment for developing countries is actually a very costly thing. Um, and what we show here is the, the, the vertical uh, part is animal source food uh, dailies, disability adjust, adjusted uh, life years. So this is the, the burden of unsafe uh, animal products. Um, uh, the, the illness and premature death. And on the bottom is an index of these capacities of, of food safety uh, related to animal products. And there's a very clear relationship here. The countries that have invested have a much lower burden than the countries that haven't have a much higher burden. And this is not just related to a higher income. Some of the countries that have done, that are doing rather well are, are, are either low or lower middle income countries. So moving forward, um, we, we advocate consistent with sort of the messaging of, of FAO and, and WHO, um, really thinking about a, a model of shared responsibility where the current model is more top down, government sets the rules, private sector sort of marches to those rules and consumers are largely passive and or angry on social media and not really playing a role. Um, and it's much more about the, the, the three segments all playing extremely important uh, integrated roles. And much of what government is doing is not only controlling, but is facilitating uh, the ability of business and of consumers to play their role. So on the right side, we have the, the inspector offering the carrot rather than the stick. So 
regulatory delivery needs to be a combination of enforcement, but also advice and encouragement and, and motivators for, uh, for vendors and small businesses and, and whatnot, and various programs for them to be compliant and not just be the recipients of, of fines. Um, so governments need to invest more and more smartly in domestic food safety. Very important is the scientific basis, the human capital basis. These are really the foundations to balance um, hardware with software, for example, labs, but all really the protocols and the quality uh, management systems. Synergies are quite important between food safety and environment, food safety and nutrition, food safety and animal health. Um, and monitoring the impacts more uh, better uh, to be able to calibrate investment. We think in the sort of post-COVID world that, that really the One Health uh, approach is going to be, um, need to be strengthened. Uh, we have it on paper now, and I think devoting more resources and more uh, effort to uh, operationalizing this on the ground is, is essential. Um, we do have a, a roadmap for that two years ago. This uh, operational framework was developed uh, in, in quite detail about how countries can go about um, uh, pursuing this, which really combines um, uh, surveillance and oversight and technical support across animal health, human health, and environmental health and where they intersect. And in, in addition to governments sort of investing more smartly, uh, it's really important to, to leverage uh, private initiative and investment. And this is in areas of knowledge, infrastructure, uh, practices, conformity, uh, assurance. So finally, but basically we, we, we look to a world of flattening the curve twice. So one is flattening the curve on, on the COVID um, uh, pandemic. And, and, and the next is really to the strategies to flatten the curve on foodborne illness and its economic impact. Yeah, economic costs. And so going into COVID, basically the, the situation was food safety awareness and capacities were highly underdeveloped in many developing countries. The vulnerability we saw is especially high for lower middle income countries, given the rapid change happening demographically and dietary. And that the pandemic has certainly accentuated these weaknesses. So countries coming out of the pandemic need to strengthen the foundations for, the, for coherent food safety and One Health systems, as well as build back better the infrastructure and supply chain relationships. Thank you very much. You can see, uh, if you go to this uh, uh, website, uh, you can find the report that I just referred to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, what great insights as a cornerstone for our discussion today. And what I'd like to do before we move on, I have a quick question for you. Uh, you know, in your charts, you showed quite a bit of diversity across developing countries. And it really suggests that a one size fits all really won't work as we try to approach uh, let's call it practical solutions to this. Do you have any suggestions for your colleagues as to how they might approach this on the food safety system? Yeah, okay, so um, look, we, we, we have a number of sort of key principles that we think should be applying across countries, the shared responsibility, uh, being preventive oriented, uh, uh, applying risk-based uh, principles or whatnot. All right, so that's, okay, that's your start, but then you, each country should be doing its diagnostic, uh, its current situation, uh, where the, uh, where the hotspots are, where the pressures are, and sort of develop sort of a realistic scenario. And maybe this is a five to 10 year orientation of how stepwise um, countries are going to advance this agenda. And, and WHO in the regional strategies that it supports often is, 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 is dealing in sort of the same language of a stepwise approach. So we look at that in, in safe food imperative, we broke it down by these uh, different stages, and we looked at uh, we looked at risk assessment, risk management, communications, and for each sort of step, what might be uh, greater prior priorities for such uh, uh, such countries. And, and as you sort of move through that progression, clearly you're going from maybe more qualitative to more quantitative, 
from more sort of pilot initiatives to more mainstreaming, um, from you know narrowing in on certain hotspots hot to later on having this more more systematic collection of of data that gives you the bigger picture. So what what is feasible uh, from a policy and a technical point of view for low income countries, uh, it will be different for for countries moving forward. So um, having a sort of a five to ten year um, stepwise strategy is sort of what we we uh, we advocate, and we've laid out some specifics. But this is really something that uh, is best done um, at a country level, facilitated with uh, multiple stakeholders. All right, thank you, Steve, and thank you so much for providing this background to our discussion today. And now it's time for our panelists to join the conversation. Uh, our first panelist is. Dr. Naoko Yamamoto, who's the Assistant Director General for Universal Health Coverage and Healthier Populations at the World Health Organization. Dr. Yamamoto brings nearly 30 years of experience uh, in health in Japan, where she served as Senior Assistant Minister of Global Health for that country, and she's organized international conferences on universal health coverage in 2015, and also she has been uh, a proponent for the promotion of universal health coverage. So welcome, Dr. Yamamoto, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you, Hank, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to join this webinar. So uh, let me start. I cannot agree more or emphasize more what Steve said that in his lecture that the foodborne diseases have a significant impact on public health. And also the uh, food safety is a key to achieve SDG goal. He mentioned several goals related to food safety. So in my intervention, I would like to say three issues. First, vision of the global food safety strategy. At the WHO Executive Board meeting this year in February, member states had a resolution named Strengthen Effort on Food Safety. It is a resolution of the end of the member state asked WHO to come up with the global food safety strategy. That's exactly the same uh, uh, understanding and the concern from the member states as uh, Steve exactly said that is at his lecture. So member states asked WHO to four main issues. They request that create new WHO global strategy for food safety in coordination with FAO and in consultation with member states and OIE. Second issue is create a coordination and continue to coordination mechanism with powers and WHO strategic effort on this area. Third area is update the global burden of foodborne disease report by 2025. Steve mentioned about the data with the 600 million people illness and that data is 2015 and we need to update. And also continue the leadership and the partnership with FAO and other partners, Codex Alimentarium, InfoSAM, it is International Food Safety Authorities Network, or Food Safety Infrastructure, New Technology, and Response to the Emerging Risk. This is a request from the member states, and our vision of the strategy is to provide safe and healthy food for all, and protect consumers' health by strengthening national food safety system. National level is the most important. This is one issue and we are going to work together all partners. So we, if you have time, we, we would like to continue the discussion that later. S second issue is nutrition and food system during COVID-19. Uh, again, the previous speaker has already mentioned about the impact, negative impact of the COVID-19 in this area. And also Tuesday, UN Secretary General launched a we call policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on food security and nutrition. In the brief paper, he mentioned about the huge impact of the nutrition and the food security issues in the world. And WHO is going to work with UNICEF, FAO, and WFP to launch a call to action to address this crisis soon. And uh, of course, we talk about, uh, we need this COVID impact. Many people like a uh, food factory, local markets, uh, food supply chain and so on. So WHO is issued several documents and guidance 
for example, like uh, uh, how to deal with the COVID-19 and the food safety and the food of businesses. Or, and we issue the document, provide advice and recommendation of national food safety authorities to optimize food control function and prioritize their uh, uh, action because there's many issues happen in COVID. Third issues, I would like to talk about post COVID-19. Um, my Steve, a previous speaker has already mentioned about uh, uh, recover better or create better world uh, uh, in terms of COVID, COVID post-COVID-19. But in addition to uh, the Steve said that, uh, I would like to add another one. The policy review UNSG mentioned urgent need to transform the world food system. So food system contributes the green gas emission and uh, also contribute uh, substantial biodiversity loss. So uh, this is uh, the urgent need to rethink how we produce, process, and market, and consume our food and dispose of the waste. So COVID-19 will give us some opportunity to rebalance and transform our food system more inclusive, sustainable, resilient, and make safer and healthier the people. So we have a similar opportunity to discuss about it. For example, like a nutrition summit hosted by Japanese government is planned to 2020, but to go to 21st, 2021 because of the COVID-19, but um, they call the member states our partner to commit the financial policy commitment that this area. And also we have uh, facing the new debut year of the decade of action on nutrition, again, this is a big uh, opportunity to discuss discuss, us, discuss about the food safety and nutrition. And in 2021, UN Secretary General has also convened a food system summit. And uh, we are going to discuss about how to reshape food system to be more secure and healthier. So this, there are many, uh, several opportunities, all of us to discuss our food safety issue. So food safety is like a everybody's business and I'm looking for to discuss further with all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Naoko. A quick question for you. How is the uh, WHO organizing uh, scientific advice for food safety and nutrition? Thank you, your question. Uh, uh, with this file, we have a codex elementarium and we have many scientists board. Of course, the previously we have a face-to-face -face meeting. Now we are everything is done by virtual way, but it works well. Well, and so we have a, some group of the pesticide residue or micro or microbial risk or nutrition and diet and many issues. In on top of it, as we mentioned in my speech, we have an info some it's an information group or the next uh, group, so, and uh, do maybe we need to create a, some good group additional group for, to discuss global food safety strategy. So uh, we, we will continue and also enhance our work with uh, all experts in the world to come up to these issues because there are many interlinked area and also multi sectors approach should be important. And not only the expert, as Steve said, that we need some uh, engagement of consumer or public people or civil society people to um, to uh, work together with us including private sector so thank you very much your question oh thank you for that and um, i'm going to move things along i have so many questions i'd love to ask all the panelists but i'd also like to leave plenty of time for our audience to be able to chime in with questions uh, so thank you so much for those insights and uh, i'd like to now introduce our next panelist uh, he is Dave Crean, who's Vice President of Corporate R&D in the Chief Science Office at Mars Incorporated. Uh, Dave brings over 30 years experience in food safety, and he leads uh, both quality and food safety at Mars. Uh, he's spoken extensively about food safety, food security, and the critical role of multi-stakeholder collaboration. He does represent the company with organizations such as the National Academy of Sciences and the World Health Organization, and he'll bring an industry perspective to this conversation. So, hello, David. Uh, my pleasure. Please go. 
Thank you, Hank, and it's an absolute privilege to be here today. Um, I'd just like to start off by saying that I think we all have in our thoughts the millions suffering with COVID-19, those who have passed, those who have experienced economic consequences due to job losses, and the many more families and communities who will likely face greater food insecurity and malnutrition hardships. We stand in solidarity with everyone seeking a better world tomorrow, grounded in the fundamental human right of access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food. At Mars, we believe everyone has the right to safe food. We see food safety as pre-competitive and we believe we have a responsibility to collaborate and share our insights, experience and knowledge while recognising that no single organisation can tackle global food safety challenges alone. We cannot underestimate the significant food security and food safety challenges brought by COVID-19. What we're hearing is that the virus is converging and potentially accelerating global food supply issues. Hunger and COVID-19 are a deadly combination. The World Food Programme estimates that the global pandemic could mean extreme hunger for up to 265 million people this year, twice the number who were already suffering from acute hunger before COVID-19. This is a devastating situation, which WFP leader David Beasley has referred to as a problem of biblical proportions. It's the most vulnerable who are impacted the most. Generally, in the broader global food supply, I think many of us are seeing what I can summarize with one word is instability. Interruption of supply, changes, sudden changes in buying behavior, logistics difficulties, and unpredictability. These issues combine to challenge the effectiveness of our supply chains today and into the future. Instability is exacerbated by difficulties in moving materials across borders, lack of additional capacity in the system, for example, insufficient storage facilities, key supply workers unable to work because of the risk to them, their families, or unsafe working conditions due to not being able to socially distance, breakdown of process and planning. Business process thrives on stability. If things aren't predictable, it's very difficult to plan. Pricing volatility, rendering operations financially unsustainable. And very worrying for me, these conditions are all ideal conditions for increasing the threat of food fraud and adulteration. The ability to respond to and mitigate these challenges often exists in developed countries, but in developing countries where resources are more scarce, these challenges may become critical failures. COVID-19 provides a stark reminder about the fragility and importance of food supply chains across the world, especially in developing countries. We have a responsibility to learn from this crisis. Learn quickly so we can manage the current impact of the, current, of the COVID-19 crisis on food supply chains today. Learn deeply and fundamentally so we can ensure we capture and apply insights to increase food supply chain resilience ahead of future crises. And leverage that learning so that we can better address existing challenges like food safety and food security. The Edelman Trust Barometer Special Report on the COVID-19 crisis showed that 78% of respondents believe that business is a critical ingredient of defense against the virus. Recently, David Nabarro has encouraged business to be a role model and partner with authorities on pre-competitive collaborative initiatives to help make systems more shock resilient, help make food and medical supply chains resilient and do what business does best, respond fast. In a crisis, the pace of innovation often increases. Necessity is the mother of invention. In addressing COVID-19, we have seen unprecedented pace and focus. The speed of research, the rate of information sharing. I'm, I'm astounded to see that we have 60 vaccines going into clinical trials by the end of the year. We've seen the power of new technologies such as whole genome sequencing. We've seen the power of global and, and rapidly forming global integrated collaborations. 
by business, governments, universities and aid agencies. These are lessons that we can take forward. And in closing, I would like to emphasise the following key challenges that must be addressed. Timely and transparent collaboration is essential. We must redouble our efforts in food safety with pace and focus. We must work as a coalition of regulators, NGOs, universities and industry to share food safety research information much faster. Our goal is clear. We must ensure safe food for everyone. Thank you, Hank. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, one of my key takeaways was the word instability sticks out to me. Uh, and you reference uh, potentially the advantages of partnering between industry, um, the private sector, and non-private sector. Can you, how, how can we address this? You know, and come up with real world solutions that work both for industry, but also most importantly for the public health. Yeah, I think, you know, when I talk, uh, Hank, about food safety being pre-competitive, I think what we've got to recognize is, you know, if, you've, if, if you're in business, you need your products to be safe. If you've got brands, consumers won't trust brands that aren't safe. If you want to build your business, you've got to develop that trust with consumer. Safe food is key in all of that. And therefore, being able to share the approach to food safety so that all parts of the food supply chain are impacted you're actually raising the water level for everybody and all boats float on the high tide. And so the argument to do this from a business point of view, I think is pretty clear. I think the challenge is how do we organize so that we can collaborate effectively and meaningfully? It's a massive challenge. And we haven't always got the right resources in place. I mean, one of the things we've done at Mars is we've recognized that research is critical and we've invested in a global food safety center that we opened in 2015, just outside Beijing in China. And being able to publish that research, share the learnings that we have, and also bring people in to connect, to, um, to uh, partner, and also for training is proving to be massively beneficial. But it's a small thing, it's a small thing, it's important, but we need to replicate that model, I think, around the world. All right, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, we really appreciate those insights and comments. Uh, our next panelist is Vincent Dumizel. Uh, Vincent brings a different type of experience to this, uh, to this panel. He has 20 years experience in food testing, inspection, and certification. Uh, he now leads the charitable objectives of the Lloyd's Register uh, Foundation by funding innovative projects to drive safety in the food supply chain. Uh, partnering with groups like the UN Global Compact, the FAO, the World Bank, and other NGOs. Um, they are concentrating right now on food safety with the objective to contribute to enable a safe and sustainable food supply to feed the world, not only for today, but looking forward to tomorrow. So welcome, Vincent. We look forward to your uh, input. Thank you very much. And uh, first, I would like to thank uh, FAO uh... Uh, for the invitation and thank all of you for uh, joining this session. The Lloyd's Register Group indeed is born in 1760. So we are obviously not the most famous nor the biggest organization in here, but quite most likely the oldest one. So we know what resilience means and there are a few uh, lessons uh, we learned from these 260 years of experience. So these lessons uh, were well demonstrated during the COVID-19. First, when talking about COVID-19, key learning is that well, food supply chain is a critical infrastructure. And in many countries, food and health organizations were the only one left to operate. So being a leader in verification and assurance, of course, we are well known for shipping, but we are all, also active in all types of sectors and, and, a, and a leader in food safety verification, delivering uh, audits to many of the global brands, including Mars, by the way. So uh, during COVID-19, our operations to monitor safety and compliance have been stopped because it was impossible to go uh, on site and, and to verify. That was a big deal for most of our clients who were about to lose their license to operate and it did create some big troubles in addition to the COVID-19 uh, uh, problem. So that is obviously a, a real issue for food safety because then you cannot make sure that the policies are in place and that the food you produce is safe. During that crisis, it is to be noted that many other sectors 
we are quite advanced in, in digital enabled solutions for remote audit using new technology and big data to ensure that the process were in place. It was made also clear that food was lagging behind in that aspect. Uh, we've seen a lot of pushback from regulators and standards to authorize remote assessment for food. While it was authorized and most of the time already piloted in other less critical sectors, such as automotive, energy, aeronautics. Uh, there's no need to put the blame on anyone for this. There are some very good reasons for this uh, very cautious uh, move. High risk involved, a lack of investment uh, historically due to low margin in food and a very small, fragmented and highly complex supply chain. Still, it made clear that we need to accelerate on digitalization for food safety controls and leverage on new technology to make sure that food is safe instead of relying only on spotted and simple on-site exercise. Solutions are existing today. We need to enable this solution and improve transparency and safety all along the supply chain with this new solution. There's a second topic of interest in relation to COVID-19, a totally different topic that is investigated right now by the Lloyd Register Foundation, indeed a charity and the sole shareholder of the Lloyd Register Group, which is a lack of transparency and the food security question. Back on COVID-19, we have to be cautious as there is no scientific evidence, yet it is likely that COVID-19 is a food safety issue and originates from animal infection coming from illegal wild meat, whatever it is in the end. Some say that the trend for illegal wild meat is due to a protein gap following that slaughtering of 300 million porks in China during the swine flu outbreak last year. So Moses says that it has been generated by cultivation move to new wild area where people like to face new type of virus and animal, whatever is the reason in the end. It shows that the system relying only on land production, providing the current growth of population and protein demand is impossible and will generate traceability and food safety major issues. The complete dependence on land production, in addition to that growing difference between a few rich people and billions of people starving to death, is not only a shame for our civilization, but it's a time bomb for all of us. We need to rely, to rely on new type of food and notably food from the ocean. Our organization, Lloyd's Register, is born around the ocean business and for almost 300 years, we learned that ocean is key to any resilient solution to any resilient business. We moved from prehistory to modern human being 12,000 years ago when we stopped being hunters gatherers to move, agriculture and li to, to move to agriculture and livestock, feeding millions of people at this time with safe food. We never did that with the ocean. While the ocean covers 70% of our planet and contribute today to less than 2% of our calorie supply. We are, so in, in that aspect, we are just starting to farm food from the ocean for the last 50 years or so. And we do that in a very unsustainable way. And we know that because we are very active in that sector. In addition, we are hampered in that growth of food from the ocean by the lack of appropriate and related food safety regulation. Hence, we developed recently and launched last week uh, with UN Global Compact, FAO, World Bank, WWF, uh, the Nature Conservancy, many private brands and many others, a strategy to improve aquaculture, notably the use of seaweeds that hold the great potential to provide directly or indirectly through feed, safe, very healthy and sustainable food to everyone on this planet. So you can check that and join us uh, on the website seaweedmanifesto.com uh, to know more about uh, uh, that ambition, seaweedmanifesto.com. And, and I think, I mean, just as a conclusion, I think despite crises such as COVID-19, if we both manage to rely on new technology for food safety and transparency, monitoring on one, on one hand, and develop new source of food while restoring abundance in the ocean, we may be remembered as the first generation on this planet who managed to provide safe and sustainable food to everyone. We could be remembered as such. And I think we will. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. And uh, you know, you mentioned remote monitoring of the food safety uh, system. Is what's still missing? How do we how do we accelerate that to even be more impactful? That, that's a very good question. Thanks. There's two different type of things that are missing. One is a global database that holds the information for the entire food safety. Once again, it's very complex. Uh, it's very fragmented. It's uh, it's a very uh, international uh, uh, that, uh, supply chain. But we need to have multiple or several databases 
and uh, with the global information on that. And so we can enable traceability and we can uh, have access to each and every uh, um, food producer and food manufacturers and so forth and track this entire supply chain. That's one thing and, 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 and a lot of innovation, blockchain being the most uh, uh, trendy one, uh, could enable that type of solution. The second thing, the type of thing that we need to enable is um, a, a way to aggregate the big data that we have on the food supply chain and, and, and make it available for uh, food verifiers, basically. And, and also there's a missing link somehow that we are actively working on at the moment, which is the digital, because blockchain may be very active for and efficient for uh, insurance of, or currencies, but uh, food is a perishable and, uh, asset that can be substituted. But, so we need to make sure that there's new type of, that we need a new marker, we need, a new, we, need, we need new generation of markers, could be DNA markers, could be microbiome footprint, could be isotopes, uh, stabilized isotopes, whatever it is. But we need to enable the connection between the digital record and the real food. I think that's what is missing, but once again, innovation, just like your smartphone, is not just only a protocol, uh, inter an internet protocol. It is the aggregation of many innovation. So there will be a lot of, there are, there is actually a lot of uh, uh, innovation that are coming together. And more importantly, what we need in the food supply chain to make this, to make it happen is to work together. It can only happen if we are all together. All right. Thank you so much, Vincent. Very unique perspectives to the conversation. Our final panelist is Dr. Jeff Lejeune. Uh, Jeff is the Food Safety and Quality Officer for FAO. Uh, he is an expert on uh, pathogen contamination of food. Jeff was previously with Ohio State University, where he was professor of food safety and the program head at the Food Animal Health Research Program for that institution. Jeff, welcome. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. And thank you all for staying tuned to this uh, interesting conversation. I'll keep my um, uh, comments a bit brief so we have adequate time for uh, discussion. But I wanted to hearken back a little bit to the introductory remarks about food security. In terms of food security, uh, we can think of it as being a pillar of having adequate access, nutrition, and safe food. Uh, however, those aren't independent pillars. They're all interactive and interconnected. Uh, For example, uh, we all understand the disruptions in our food supply. Uh, and if people can't get food, they can't get nutrition. So then that pillar kind of collapses under the current conditions. Um, the current uh, major crisis that we're facing right now is some interruption in the, the access to food or disruptions in the food supply, either due to illnesses of agricultural workers uh, because of unsafe working conditions or even the act, uh, absence of supplies, the supply chain management where people can, cannot get seeds, cannot get fertilizer, cannot uh, ship uh, their products to market and which interrupts. So there's adequate uh, food, but it's getting it to the people, which results in a food security issue. The last pillar I wanted to talk about is the food safety. Now, um, there is no evidence, and I think this was mentioned, that uh, animals, uh, livestock, food producing animals are carriers of the virus that causes the COVID-19. And there have been no implications of food that's in the market uh, to cause the disease or illness in people. Okay, so our food supply, when available, is safe uh, with respect to the virus uh, causing uh, the disease. Nevertheless, it's still critically important, I don't know how much I, I can't underscore the statement, that we maintain those controls in place to keep our food supply safe. That is the, the personal hygiene and the environmental sanitation throughout the food chain. Um, these uh, principles are, are well documented and can be found, for example, in uh, uh, Codex Elementarius documents on uh, uh, best practices for or general principles for food hygiene or the control of viruses in meat. So it is important to keep uh, viruses and other pathogens out of the food supply. In fact, and this number came up before, 600 million people fall ill to foodborne illnesses, okay? And 
we all understand the impact of the health impact of COVID-19 on people and the taxation that's putting on our public health system. So we, the last thing we need right now is more foodborne illnesses to kind of further tax the health system. So if we can prevent foodborne illnesses that are out there and prevent new ones, we can better accommodate and cope with the current situation. So the last point I wanted to make, uh, it deals with what lessons we have learned. Where, where, what do we go to and where can we come from? So during this current outbreak, uh, a pandemic, if you will, we're learning a lot of things about the vulnerabilities and weaknesses in our food system. Okay, I would like to call it more of a food system than a chain because it's not a direct linear connection of point A to B. And if we act in one location, it could have direct or indirect effects in another point within our food system. So as we identify these weaknesses and vulnerabilities, uh, that's important. And it's important because we can take those looking at the other side of the coin and say, these are areas where we can work to intervene to strengthen our food supply in the future. So a take home message of, of where we can improve so we can help prevent the next pandemic. And, and it's important that we document these, take notes of them and base our interventions and strategies on science, not on myths, hearsay and fear, but on something that we can potentially document and validate as validated and effective control measures to prevent the a transmission of an organism like this in our food chain. So with that, I think I'll, I'll close and, and, and move on to the, the discussion period. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, just a quick question for you. Uh, from a microbiologist perspective, how is this pandemic different than previous ones? Yeah, that's it. Thanks for asking that because we haven't really discussed much about the the, uh, the microbiology of the, the current pandemic. And as, as a microbiologist, we think often as a, a disease outcome as being an interaction between the host or the human population, the environment, which we've talked quite a bit about the food production chain, food production system. And the third component of that interaction is the, the infectious agent. So here we're talking about the, the, the SARS uh, coronavirus 2 variant that's there. Um, the, the virus itself uh, binds to cells that line the airways of humans, uh, say in the, in the mouth and in the, in the lungs and also in the nose. And there's some receptors also in the gastrointestinal tract. Now the receptors that other animals have are different than those of humans. And there's some similarities and, we, and, and this uh, receptor binding kind of, uh, kind of defines the host range. So we can see some infection in, in cats and ferrets experimentally and we had some outbreak in mink. But fortunately in this case, and I say that we're fortunate, I mean, what we see is horrific in terms of the human toll and illnesses and death, but it has not shown up in uh, food producing animal populations probably because of this difference in receptor binding. And so it keeps it out of our food chain. And it, it is one less area that we have to uh, concern ourselves about the transmission in the food, but we have to worry about contamination uh, from outside sources, not from endogenous from within the food chain. So that would be one aspect, I think, from a microbiological standpoint that really differentiates this from uh, other outbreaks that we've had. and may not be different for the next one that emerges in our, our society. Yeah, great perspective, thank you. Well, what I'd like to do is move into um, the audience's questions for the panelists. Um, this first one looks like it's for Dave. Um, I'll read it directly. Big companies have a history of using lip service to investment in capacity development and supporting academia research and producers. Will post-COVID change the capitalist agenda and secure conscious capitalism? Obviously, there's a point of view there. Yeah. Dave? Um, I think there's um, been a lot of discussion around the value of privately sponsored research. Um, and I, I really uh, resonate with what uh, Jeff was just saying about you know, the interventions that we need to make for the future of food security. 
really need to be based on excellent research that's been rigorously, rigorously reviewed. And I think if you're thinking about, you know, what can we do in terms of making sure that we improve the food supply, the people who handle food, whether it's farmers, whether it's people involved in logistics, whether it's the manufacturers, they all have to be involved. If you're going to improve the food supply chain, you need to involve everybody who's in the food supply chain. So what's the contribution that business can make? We've got millions of man hours of experience of how to make products. We've got millions of man hours of experience of how to work with suppliers, of how to work with customers, of how to preserve quality, of how to handle difficult situations. And so if we can find the right way of sharing that experience, and also through that experience, identify where are the right areas that we should be researching for the future, I believe that's a very open, a very transparent, and a very honest contribution to make. Uh, I said before that you know, we've opened up a, a global food safety centre, and although we've got a bricks and mortar building, we've also got a very exciting network of collaborators. We've got a very clear science policy. Um, and whatever the study is, whatever we do, we publish the results, whether they're good or they're bad. And we're asking questions, not because we want to um, influence the outcome, but because we want to know the answer, we want to share that data, and through sharing that data, we can make the food supply chain safer and more sustainable. If we don't get this right, and um, you know, it was nice to hear Vincent talk about, can we be the first generation to actually solve sustainability in the food supply sense? If we don't get this right, we won't have food supply. We won't have enough food of the right quality to feed the burgeoning population that's going to um, that, that's happening on the planet today. So I think this is a challenge that unites us all. I think it's a challenge where industry needs to be transparent, and I think industry needs to deliver very high quality information, data, and participate in the best research. The key for me is that we need trust and we need the right collaborations. Trust comes from, I think, transparency, openness, and consistency. And, and that's what we need to be. And I think, you know, from speaking for the business, I can't speak for all business, I can speak for my business. I know that my shareholders, uh, my key stakeholders, are focused on ensuring that we'll have a business not only today, but tomorrow. And to do that, we need sustainable food supplies. And food safety, food security is a key part of ensuring that. Um, so I hope, Hank, that goes some way to, to uh, answering the question. Well, I, do, I do think it goes a long way. And actually, I'd like to build on that because there are companies like Mars who have stepped up. I mean, there is a Sustainable Food Policy Alliance, which includes Mars and companies like Unilever and Nestle and Danone that have stepped up that say this is important. And they actually walk their talk. They're actually doing things in this arena because it's not only the right thing to do, it's good for their consumers. And oh, by the way, we've learned that it's also good for business. So we see this interesting confluence, uh, which we haven't seen over the past few decades, where now the, the timing is right for all these actions. And, and I think Dave could not have said it better because uh, I do see companies stepping up, not all, but companies like Mars certainly are. Uh, let me move to other questions. Um, here's one, and I, it doesn't have any person um, charged with this, but I'll throw it out there. According to FAO strategy, what about the food safety related to uh, edible insects, especially in Africa? Uh, any policies there or insights on that? Someone want to step up on that? I guess I can, can I, Go can you hear me? Yes. Certainly. And chime in here a bit. Uh, it has been brought to our attention that um, people are moving, uh, well, let's just say insects have been consumed for millennia by people around the globe, uh, more in certain uh, cultures than in others. Uh, people are looking at edible insects as a, a potential source of, of a protein that could potentially be uh, harvested and, and grown intensively as a, a alternate protein source. And so it is on our radar. Uh, we are kind of exploring. And again, I think what we need to be doing is, is from a scientific approach, uh, gathering that data, looking at it, and, uh, and making assessments, again, based on the 
science that's out there. Um, th there are some risk associated, but there's also benefits. So uh, as a, a risk assessor, I think FAO can continue to evaluate that uh, process and then uh, countries uh, through, say, for example, the Codex Alimentarius process, if they're interested, can develop the standards which they think are justified based on the evidence of science. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, here's another question. Um, what role in its significance do you see controlled environment agriculture like aquaponics playing as a solution to the issues that have been identified today? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I do if you want to. Yes, please. Yeah, well, we, we see, and that was a part of what I explained, uh, the future of aquaculture around, around multi integration of multitrophic, indeed, and aquaponics being one of them. Clearly, uh, there, there's a lot of challenge to that in open sea and in the ocean. Uh, but I think that we need to understand better, indeed, the interaction. We have relied way too much on uh, monoculture uh, over the last uh, uh, 12,000 years. And I think we need to understand the interaction between different cultures, and it's even more important in the ocean. And I think that it goes beyond sustainability somehow in the ocean. We, are, we, we need to talk about restoration, but because well, we are the first generation to know that there's a big uh, biodiversity loss that is taking place right now. So if we don't do it right, not only we will produce less food, but, but we will lose a lot of biodiversity uh, uh, in the ocean and on land. So we are beyond sustainability, I think. It was a world saying that be, uh, sustainability is a 20th century world. We are beyond that. No, we are into restoration. We need to restore the environment. We need to restore this ecosystem to produce more food and to restore abundance, be it on land or in the ocean. And I think that this kind of very well uh, controlled environment, very carefully monitored environment, are absolutely key to restore that abundance uh, in ocean and on land. All right. Thank you, Vincent. A uh, question here on genetics. Um, sir, I'd like to know if any steps have been taken at, gene at the genetic level for food safety, mainly for this pandemic. Anyone have any uh, opinions on that? Jeff, is that something you have some thoughts on? Um, I guess I, I'm not quite sure in terms of the question. I mean, I mentioned uh, disease outcomes are uh, a result of the host, the human. So are we, are we talking about human genetics or are we talking about the genetics of the virus? So there's an interplay between two things there that, um, that could uh, actually uh, potentially, I, I haven't read papers on, on the host susceptibility to, to the virus, but we do know that there is a, a, a massive uh, sequencing uh, kind of um, program underway to track this virus to see uh, how it's been spread and how it's slowly changing a little bit over time. Um, but other than that, I don't have any uh, comments. Okay. Um, let me move to the next question. We heard a lot uh, about sustainable food systems these days, but I was wondering what does it mean for low and middle income countries? Would this concept be too ambitious for these countries, especially those that still have many shortages? in food safety systems? Well, uh, I, I may say, well, once again, coming back to, uh, to my seaweed, uh, I, I just wonder how come 99.5% uh, of seaweed cultivation, cultivation occurs in, uh, in, uh, in Asia today. So 99.5, so it's almost 100% of the cultivation of seaweed occurs in Asia. How come only one region in the world has learned to cultivate a resource that does not need land, fresh water, they do not need uh, any chemical, they do not need any investment, it's a very, very low capex uh, uh, cultivation culture. So the question is now, I, mean, I think, I think we, could, we, we should think out of the box and find new solution, but there should be very sustainable uh, solution available to the poor people. And by the way, uh, in the manifesto, it is stated that one of the, and that's why the World Bank is very interested into it. And this type of new uh, uh, culture are seen as a way to alleviate poverty uh, in the world. And even uh, because of out of experience in Africa and, and uh, Southeast Asia, we've seen that women were benefiting from this new source of revenue. So it's also a source of, uh, of gender equity possibly. 
So I think we should, uh, we should not see the, the new solution as more expensive than the existing one. Okay, thank you, Vincent. Uh, question for Nauco. Uh, is the WHO going to update the figures of the burden of foodborne diseases? Thank you, the question. Um, as I said that the, the previous number, I mean, we mentioned the three, 600 million people, they had the illness of the foodborne diseases. That is come from the uh, WHO report 2015. And uh, I, I introduced the uh, like, um, uh, resolution of the member state to WHO. They asked us, I mean, asked WHO to revise the data or new data by 2025. So definitely we are going to work with our other uh, colleagues to come up with some new data to estimate the foodborne burden, but foodborne disease burden. But most important things, uh, several speakers has already mentioned about data, how to measure the foodborne disease burden, how each country has a good capacity to monitor and measure it. So uh, as a bridge uh, together with our other partners with academia, we need to come up with a good indicator, first of all. If you see the SDG, so, uh, Sustainable Development Goal, each goal has some um, indicator who can use to measure. But for the foodborne diseases, there are, um, I should say, very few or like a direct indicator. We don't have a direct indicator. So we, we would like to work together with all academia that people to come at a good indicator, but at the same time, we need uh, some good monitoring system. In the, uh, in the country, but yes, we are going to devise it because uh, burden is huge. So thank you, your question. All right, thank you. Here's another one. COVID-19 appears to be associated with diet-related chronic disease, such as obesity, diabetes, car cardiovascular disease. Do you expect progress in diet-related disease prevention or mitigation? Oops. Okay, so let me say that way because uh, uh, because of the several data show that uh, they are high risk group. We, I should say to the, the disease uh, symptoms is getting worse uh, in the group of the obesity or NCD and non communicable diseases and these people. But uh, we are sure the COVID nineteen mitigate the risk of the NCD. We hope that we COVID nineteen is up to have a trigger or engine to review our healthy diet. But uh, as we discuss here, uh, the, we also concern not only the uh, chronic uh, impact, but we it really concerned about and facing a challenge about uh, uh, food security issues. In the world, uh, the David has already said that before the COVID, we have to 820 million people are hunger and many children is more 100 more than one, nearly 150 million children under age 5 are stunted and this number is getting worse because of the covid-19 and food supply so uh, we need to tackle die issues together with uh, chronic disease as well i think all right thank you so much here's another question for the group so can we get a view on donated food? It should remain safe and because it originally originates from most likely safe food sources, we assume the food is still safe at the point of consumption. How do we assure safety in the informal sector and with the current food shortages and food donation drives? What experiences can we learn from the UN and disaster management? Uh, let me uh, ask Dave to chime in on the first half of that. Uh, question. Yeah, thanks, Han. I think um, you know, depending on, the, on you know, there's a, there's a piece of risk assessment work that needs to be done here, and I think it all depends on the food. So if it's kind of shelf stable canned things, ambient stable products like pasta, dry rice, those sorts of things, um, once they're made, they're pretty robust uh, and provided they're stored in reasonable conditions, they're not going to create much of a food safety issue. And if they're being donated to food banks and that sort of thing or or, or, or donated to organizations who are going to distribute them i think you can do that reasonably safely it's i think we've got to be a little bit more more careful when it comes to things with short shelf life um, and things that are higher risk so meat-based products dairy based products those sorts of things we've got to be a lot more careful about and i think you know 
when we're thinking about donating, when we're thinking about making these contributions, I don't think we can assume that it's coming from a safe place or that it's always going to be safe. Um, and so there's a balance here between making sure we can maximize availability, but also have a basic level of due diligence, if you like, to make sure that what we're, what we're actually distributing is safe. Um, and as I say, I think coming back to you know, a basic good piece of risk assessment work could help support those groups in that activity. Um, just building on, on your response there, it seems to me that uh, we have a lot of um, di disparate pieces playing here. We have the manufacturers, we have those who distribute the foods, uh, we have restaurants, we have food banks, we have agriculture itself. I mean, they're turning over, um, you know, destroying vegetables, they're dropping, uh, they're flushing fresh milk down drains. Uh, people can't get food who need it. It, it just seems like we're, we're not in sync. We're not in alignment, even though at least in, uh, in America and in North America, we have an abundance of food. It just seems that uh, it's, uh, all the parts aren't talking to each other. Do you have a point of view on that? Yeah, and, and I think it comes back to what I was talking about before. When you introduce instability or uncertainty into the food supply system, you know, I, I always think of it of a system of gears that are finely intermeshed. And, and when you get little bits of instability, they don't mesh anymore. Um, and so all of a sudden you're left with products that nobody wants. You know, if, you've, if you're producing milk and that's primarily going to large cafeterias on university campuses, and all of a sudden that's not there anymore, it's very difficult to switch the cows off. You know, you're still going to be producing the milk and, and where's it going to go? Um, you know, perhaps in time you can say, okay, well, perhaps some of that be could become other dairy products, cheese, yogurt, those sorts of things. But you can't just flick a switch and make those changes. And so I think, you know, these are exceptional times, exceptional situations going on. There is more that we could do. And I think the better coordination with, with, with um, better data and better information about, you know, who needs what, where and when, I'm, I'm sure we... You know, in answer to the question, could we do better? Of course. And perhaps finding a way to kind of um, um, build a, a, a joint capability between the different sectors that you mentioned would help us help us to do that. Yeah, thank you for your candor on that. It, it's a tough issue, I know, not only for manufacturers, but the entire food system. Here's a question that I think uh, our folks from FAO and um, uh, the WHO might be able to help us with. How can we communicate to governments the importance of food safety when there are so many competing priorities in the region? Or has COVID-19 actually raised the profile of food safety and can we exploit that? Um, Jeff, you want to tackle that from an FAO perspective? Uh, sure, I'll give it a go. In indeed, I think uh, one of our major priorities is food safety in terms of food security. And without safe food, there's no food security. Uh, how we get that message across, uh, I think is, is through webinars like this and through other uh, outlets and, and discussions with countries. Um, I think that the COVID-19 has actually raised the profile of the whole food system in general. I think our upcoming food system summit uh, will uh, address some of that and, and inclusive of food safety. So I think putting it up front and, and prioritizing that as a integral part of other components. Food safety is integral to food sustainability. Uh, food safety is integral to uh, water and environmental health. And it's a one health approach that we need to push forward and, and get as many people on board to spread the message, if you will, that uh, it is critical and, and looking at the numbers, uh, the number of foodborne illnesses is, as we mentioned, 600 million a year. That is, is similar to about the number of um, two and a half times the number of malaria cases that occur annually. Uh, however, we do f seem to fall off the radar a little bit and the issue is that these are preventable illnesses that we need to uh, highlight and bring to attention and we can make a big impact on health around the globe. All right, thank you, Jeff. Now, Co, do you have any thoughts on that from a, a yeah. WHO perspective? Yes, uh, maybe this is a, thank you very much this question and this uh, point. 
I, I personally say that I also face the same problem. Uh, as WHO, of course, uh, with I, my, my position is self, self important, but also health sector and Minister, Minister of Health, they have many other issues, diseases, healthcare services, injury, NCD, and non communicable disease, maternal child health, so on. But, so the prioritization or mainstreaming of the food safety, food system issues in the health sector is the most important point and the political commitment very important and very necessary. But I am always optimistic because, because economic growth, as uh, uh, I see Steve uh, show that some graph, the transition graph, it's uh, many country right now entering the, from the tran uh, tra 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 transition to transition or modernizing. The, then the many country recognized that food system, food safety and nutritious food is very important in the society, not only the health sector. I would like to work with our other colleagues to use this opportunity to, to create a good trigger to work for it. And this is also um, the testimony of the, from the member states, they recognizing. That's why they uh, come up the resolution I said to the, my speech. So I, I hope <laughs> we can do more. Thank you. Thank you so Hank? much. Hank, can I come in on this one? Yes, please. This is Steve. So I, I think the profile will be raised, but really the issue is what the governments do with that. Um, because budgets are going to be highly strained right now. Um, and so food safety will now be competing with ev even uh, heavier uh, demands from elsewhere in the economy. And the, the, the easy solution uh, right now looks to be to, to to uh, work to crack down on the informal sector, right? So that seems to be, first we're gonna see uh, live animal markets um, be uh, restrained. Um, and then the question is, is what's going to happen with traditional food markets, which actually feed the majority of the population in, in most developing country cities. So there's, a, there's actually a massive challenge now about how do you reinvent rather than crush uh, the traditional market systems, um, and what resources is government going to use to do that? Because then, if you're if you're not going to commit resources, then you're basically going to commit a police force, um, and you're going to sweep uh, away the the street vendors, and you're going to shut down the traditional markets. That doesn't cost you very much, and you are budget constrained, and that seems to be uh, a solution because it helps social distance and whatnot, but basically it's going to result in a um, um, a, um, a very severe adverse impact on people's access to affordable nutritious foods. So I, I do think the messaging as we engage with governments on the with this increased recognition, this is this is actually a, a critical turning point to what's going to be the, the trajectory now of, of, um, of um, perishable food markets and what course it's going to take. Uh, it could take a very bad course in my mind uh, if we're not careful about um, uh, the messaging and the advice and, and presenting workable solutions that you can have um, strong remnants of the traditional market system, but in a more hygienic and um, environmentally uh, um, benign uh, way. Because this, I think, is, is on the minds of, of policymakers now. Look, the, the, the live markets are people's preference. It actually, uh, people prefer to buy in that way. Um, but, uh, and I'm not, I'm not talking exotic animals, I'm talking chickens um, um, and fish and, and whatnot. Um, so look, moving to chilled systems is definitely going to work in terms of improved food safety, but it's going to work at the expense of nutrition of the poor. So it's a trade-off and it's a balancing act. And I, and I think this is where we're going to have, uh, uh, it's gonna be difficult conversation with, uh, with governments on how to, how to deploy and redeploy resources to have a, uh, an inclusive food system and include, uh, in addition to being a safer one. Can I chime in on this too, please? Yeah, 
Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, uh, at the risk of being a little bit <laughs> maybe controversial with Steve's comments, I don't know that we have to compartmentalize this and, and it's trade off, trade off. There's a potential for somewhat of a win win situation here if we fully integrate food safety principles with the other principles in terms of disease transmission principles. Again, this is a, a somewhat of a, a narrower uh, view of the system, but there is opportunity to take those resources that are going to be invested in, say, COVID and kind of dual use the, prop, uh, the, the information and the in, uh, transmission to build on food safety. So it's an opportunity to enhance the communication and build and strengthen food safety systems, recognizing that there's still one pie of money but I think we, this is how we need to uh, take advantage of the system to, to enhance the safety of the food supply under these conditions. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the comments on this too. What, a, what an outstanding panel. And I'd, I'd like to um, bring in Barbara Stinson to wrap things up and provide her perspectives and thinking about today and our key takeaways. Uh, Barbara is the president of the World Food Prize Foundation. She's only the second president of this organization since it was established in 1986. She previously was co-founder and senior partner of the Meridian Institute, which is a very renowned nonprofit organization that guides collaboration and drives action to address the world's most complex challenges. So she obviously has dealt with multiple facets of connecting all the dots. Uh, she does bring more than 30 years of experience in environmental public policy and business management. Last 10 years have been on uh, food security and food safety, and that is her priority right now. So I'd like to introduce Barbara Stinson. Welcome. Thank you so much, Hank. And Great to be here. What a tremendous panel of speakers today. Really, uh, such an assemblage covering so many important perspectives, uh, which is always critical in addressing uh, such dynamic and complex challenges and issues. So I'm in a new position now, um, striving to address global food security issues. Uh, but I really started my work in this arena in food safety, uh, addressing aflatoxin and other contaminants. and Honestly, I found an immediate passion for these issues um, for a lot of reasons. And I can, I can harken back to 2015 uh, with the Global Burden of Disease report coming out and uh, the attention that got focused on uh, food safety issues at that time. It, it, it was building, but it, was, uh, it really launched in a substantial way at that time addressed substantially at the Committee on Food Security then. And that's when I started really hearing this term, there is no food security without food safety. And it's true uh, you know, across the world and throughout the, the supply chain. So uh, I just wanna say that we're hearing so much about the resilience in the global food system, about building that resilience. How are we going to do it? Uh, we, we're paying attention along the supply chain uh, throughout and really working so hard to produce more food for the growing population. And you hear the numbers, you know, every, every time we've heard it today. And yet we know we need to reduce food waste and the perhaps the largest um, area of work and focus that needs to come out, especially in a pandemic of COVID-19, is the attention to producing food that is safe and retaining the safety of the food system that we've built and, and really advancing it in all the ways that people have talked about today. Uh, this is paramount because, you know, we're, we're working to produce all this food and here it is in, in the system and with tremendous challenges to the safety and causing such foodborne disease and other, other issues. So uh, we see a growing concern. We, uh, we certainly see public health attention going on, more cooperation. Uh, last year was the first uh, World Food Safety Day. We just celebrated it again, and that's um, thank you FAO uh, and WHO for hosting this event on the heels of that. It's so important. Codex is paying attention. The UN agencies are focused on this. Um, 
And what we really see is this cooperation increasing and the private sector coming in as Dave elaborated on when in a pre-competitive mode, uh, really trying to advance the cooperation, which is essential. You see it in the industry and in the Global Food Safety Initiative and other initiatives mentioned today. You see it in their investment and you see it in potentially in cooperative investment. So I just, I just want to uh, emphasize the importance of, of that of a year ago, the first international food safety conference being hosted by F FAO and WHO and the African Union Commission hosted in Addis Ababa, hosted also in Geneva on economic and trade issues. And uh, it, it advanced the discussions and advanced the global attention on these issues. And we have to keep that going. What we know about this pandemic is that it magnifies the issues in the global food system, the breaks, the weaknesses, um, the, the real areas of vulnerability. And it's so true in food safety as well. So um, the global food safety strategy that's being developed, the commitment by WHO to provide a 2025 global food burden report again, uh, you know, that it will launch, it can and should launch us again as we build towards um, these events coming, coming ahead of us. We have uh, a Committee on Food Safety meets every year. They're coming again. They'll focus on these issues as we elevate them. Uh, then the UN Food Systems Summit coming up in 2021 uh, is, is also critical. We here at the World Food Prize Foundation, we will host a series of meetings in October. We'll focus on resilience in the food system. We will focus on the importance of food safety. So I think bringing together the resources, data, technology, the, uh, the public-private sector cooperation, uh, the ability to respond quickly, to make changes now so that the system doesn't continue to perpetuate in directions we don't want to go, this is crucial. Uh, compliance leadership that you see within the industry is, uh, is, is crucial because not every country can manage and monitor compliance. So uh, I'd just like to close by saying uh, this industry and the, uh, and the work that goes on with the public agencies on these matters, it's in a way a model uh, for us on how we can handle modifications to the food system to create more resilience going forward. We should look at it that way. We should take up this challenge that we have for the next 18 months to really advance uh, all of these issues. And we will lend our platform at the World Food Prize to do so at well in all the coming years. Thank you so much, Hank. Uh, Barbara, thank you. What a great capsule summary of everything, uh, all the complex subjects that were covered today. We really appreciate it. Uh, that's it for our session. I'd like to thank FAO and uh, WHO for sponsoring this. Also, I'd like to thank all our speakers and panelists, uh, Vimlendra, Steve, and Nauko, Dave, Vincent, and Jeff. Uh, what tremendous insights you provide from many different directions. And I hope you as an audience uh, were able to learn and understand these important issues and uh, there's more to be discussed. There's a lot of meat here that we have to continue to chip away at to make progress. So thank you again for coming today, and we look forward to you attending future events. Take care, be safe.